Hello, everybody on the internet, and welcome. We are here again tonight for our latest Guelph Physics live stream, coming to you live from the abandoned carcass of the McNaughton building. Uh, <laughs> we've got a pretty exciting one here tonight. I wanted to thank everybody who uh, was at our last stream uh, with Dr. John Dutcher. Just to point out, that's still available on YouTube if you want to go back and take a look. Um, now, tonight, we wanted to have a bit of a focus on uh, first-year physics, especially for incoming students and for existing students. Our guests with us here tonight are very well-loved by many of the students that they've had throughout the years. Um, they've also uh, fulfilled one of the biggest requirements that we needed for this stream, which is that they're available. So... Without any further ado, I'd like you to introduce uh, to you our, our colleagues of mine. I've known them, I guess, both of them probably for almost 15 or 20 years at this point. Uh, yeah, now I guess it's not the time for me to have an existential crisis realizing how old I actually am. Um, so let's just roll this into the fun and enjoyable stream that we're going to have tonight. And we'll welcome uh, Dr. Martin Williams and Dr. Joanne O'Meara. Let's give them a round of applause on the internet there. Mm. You can go ahead and talk. It's it's live. <laughs> I thought you were introducing us first, Orbex. Oh, okay. Well, um, that voice could only be of one person. Uh, she is Dr. Joanne O'Meara, who's joining us here tonight. Um, I, I don't really have any any amazing sort of introduction uh, for her besides uh, the fact that I, I guess I've known Joanne since she's uh, more or less since you came here about twenty years ago. Um, and Martin as well. Uh, Dr. Martin Williams is with us. Uh, and now the focus tonight was this idea that we were going to discuss a lot about first year, talk about successful strategies for physics and really what a first year environment is. But I think it's important, uh, just in case people don't know who you are, to discuss a little bit about how you came to physics and how you came to teach at Guelph. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with you, Joanne. Sure. So um, I started my undergrad at McMaster uh, a while ago, and I did first year science. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, I thought biology, but um, then as I went along, um, I decided that my interests were more in physics and math. So I ended up going into um, the applied physics program there at McMaster, did my undergrad, PhD. And then um, as I was a grad student, I did a lot of TAing, and I really enjoyed being in the classroom and being in the lab. Um, and so I really wanted to find a position where I would be teaching. Um, after my postdoc, I went to Mac for a year again to be a prof. And then I got offered a job here, which is where my husband uh, was already teaching. So that made it a lot easier not having to commute from Guelph to Hamilton. So that's how I ended up at Guelph. Exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, in doing the research to just try to kind of put together a timeline of, of when this stuff took place, um, you very quickly moved from doing your BSc right all the way through to finishing your PhD in medical physics, right? Um, and then going on to do nuclear engineering at MIT as well for a bit of a postdoc. Yep. Um, so that's all pretty exciting stuff. Now, uh, looking at the timeline of that that I've laid out for myself, that really seems to make sense. Whereas we moved to Dr. Williams, this just seems like a lot of fake credentials that were created out of nowhere. Um, so maybe he could, he could shed some light on this. They saw he did a PhD in condensed matter physics at Imperial College University of London, which seems like a fake name. Um, and then moving on to University of Guyana and to Nottingham. Can you talk to us a little bit, uh, Dr. Williams, about these fake credentials of yours? <laughs> I uh, talked to uh, the, the Professor Orbach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and hi to everyone out there uh, who's taken time out to join us. I'm really glad, uh, glad to have you with us. And um, uh, hopefully it's going to be a really great evening uh, and that you uh, get something out of this time. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, as uh, the Orbach said earlier, so um, I do two things at the moment. I have two hats. I uh, teach in the department and I also moonlight as the director of the Office of Teaching and Learning out of the Office of, uh, of the Provost, which is basically uh, uh, um, just uh, when I'm bored, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> but I think what I wanted to say most importantly, the, the, the most important bit that you need to take away is that there are three things that are really important to me. 
I love physics, love my family, love Liverpool Football Club, hate Man U. Not necessarily in that order. This might just, be a record just, that you've made it two minutes it in without there. mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just putting it out there so <laughs> so so that I have you know that we are all on the same page. But yeah, so I <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of came to Guelph as James as as uh, the as Jay said via sort of the the, the, um, the UK where I did most of my schooling. So I uh, did my stuff at Imperial College and then did some postdoc work, the work at Imperial for a little while, then had a position at the University of Guyana, which is in South America. So went back there, spent a, a couple of years, then came back to Imperial, then the, spent a couple of years at Imperial, went to the University of Nottingham, um, also spent some time there. And then from Nottingham, I came to Guelph. And what brought me to Guelph actually was the, a solution to a, a famous two-body problem that's very sort of common in physics. Um, so my wife, I followed my wife, uh, uh, who after six years as a vet <laughs> was bored and wanted to, to sort of go back to school, which I thought was a weird idea, not a very good idea. And apparently the program that she was interested in was at some place called Guelph that I had no, never heard of, no, no clue. Um, but apparently boasted the oldest epi, epidemiolo the epidemiological program in North America, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They made her an offer that she, she couldn't refuse, and the rest, as they say, is history. So she ended up here, and um, as a good spouse, I followed. So came kicking and screaming, so that's how um, I sort of arrived at the University of Guelph. Exciting. Well, that's fantastic. It's... Um... It's interesting, uh, you know, you, you both become so renowned and well-known as teachers and instructors, um, but I, I always find that it's interesting to hear about the physics that got you in through that door in the first place in the research. Um, instructors don't start out as physics instructors. Oftentimes you're coming at it as a physicist and you later find that you have a passion or a love for teaching. Um, would either of you like to speak to this idea of uh what's going what's been happening with uh are we are we okay i heard that we had no audio mm -hmm. this is all the excitement of a live stream <laughs> coming to you mm -hmm. um so i guess we'll go with you martin yeah uh, the, the the question would be you, you actually worked in condensed matter physics and you got into teaching how did that transition take place so, so yeah that's really actually quite interesting so the, most of my stuff my interests i uh, well in a previous life, I was an experimental condensed matter physicist, mm -hmm. more sort of semiconductor physics. And I did my work at what we call low temperature, high magnetic field. And that had its issues in terms of when I came to Canada, there are very few institutions that had similar infrastructure in place to sort of facilitate that type of research. So um, I was, I, I was, I wasn't drawn into teaching. Probably a better description is that I stumbled into the teaching, and uh, perhaps and there's some sort of serendipity to that, uh, because I actually, when I started out as a uh, as a junior professor, I started out loving research, but hating teaching, or rather hating students. Probably that's probably a better discuss, uh, description. And uh, actually, the feeling was mutual. I think my students hated me too. So, <laughs> so um, I thought that I really thought it was a waste. Uh, I was wasting my time. The, these students were unteachable. They had the, the, they had physics proof heads, as far as I was concerned. So full of myself, and it was the sort of proverbial casting pearl, pearls at swine, in terms of the, the. So that was a snapshot of what I thought about teaching as a young sort of professor, um, and I think that. Uh, the, the change occurred when I sort of overheard a conversation in the corridors between two former students who were who were ex
All right. Well, we, we're running into our first series of technical glitches here. I don't know if uh, uh, what is, is what, uh, what is. Oh, yeah, there I am. And I'm all uh, resized and, and different. As well. This is the, the beauty of things happening in a live environment is rolling with the punches and seeing how they're going now. I think uh, Martin has been muted. Did you, can you unmute yourself, Martin? Um, <clears throat> we're running into some technical difficulties here on the end of the Skype. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we are. It's okay, yes. So I believe we didn't get any of that. Is it possible for you <laughs> to? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a nutshell, I, I, what, uh, what I said basically is that um, I wasn't sort of drawn into teaching. I actually stumbled into it. Um, I started out actually absolutely loving research, the research that I did, mm -hmm. but hating teaching or rather hating students because I think... Right. So, and I believe we, we, we were able to hear you up to the point where you got to the pivotal conversation in the hallway. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Right. So... Um, the, so the, that after that conversation, it made me sort of take uh, stock in terms of whether or not, you know what was happening, the, um, why it is that my students hated the, my classrooms so much, and that led to to the sort of quest and trying to figure out what you know what makes a good uh, teacher. And I said I was really fortunate in terms of uh, finding some really excellent mentors. Uh, to sort of um, to take my hands and sort of lead me through some of this stuff. And what was really quite interesting, it, the, um, this stuff, I, I became totally hooked on this stuff. Oh. And um, it's, uh, so teaching for me now is, uh, is, you know, such a passion. And unfortunately, I dream about teaching physics, which <laughs> probably means I need help. And perhaps because I don't, I don't get out a lot. <laughs> but yeah, in a snapshot, uh, the, the, that is, uh, that's basically uh, how um, I ended up more teaching. I still do research, but more physics education research, and not a lot of the traditional uh, research. Interesting. How about uh, how about you, Joanne? Uh, what was your transition from going from actually? delving into the field of medical physics to getting you hooked on teaching? Where did that come from? Uh, that's a good question. So I think it was really as a grad student working as a TA. Um, and uh, actually, I started as an undergrad working as a TA. Uh, at McMaster, that was an option. So I just really enjoyed engaging with students in the lab and um, tutoring. And uh, it, it just evolved from there. Interesting. So. Now, if we could go through, uh, so I was a little bit rattled there. We had so many technical glitches. <laughs> Information. I was swear, you awesome. all just had a glimpse of what my teaching has been like this semester. <laughs> exactly, yes, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, it does, it does bring that to mind then. I mean, you know, you, you two are passionate instructors and educators who really, the classroom approach and that sort of hands-on live and in-person approach has kind of been thrown out the window this semester. Um, how are you finding coping with that? What What are you finding now in terms of teaching that's really getting you into that? I think uh, Martin, are you teaching this semester at all? No, I'm not. Uh, no, no, I'm not teaching this semester. I taught in the winter at the start of the the, the, the lockdown, the last three weeks of the winter semester. But I haven't taught. Uh, I'm teaching in the um, in the winter coming, but not so, at the moment. So, so do I? You're gearing up and you're getting a chance to look at everything yeah. that's kind of coming in to put together yeah. your plan. Whereas Joanne, I think, has kind of been thrust into the middle of teaching this semester. How are you finding that? Are you finding that that students has obviously got to be a little bit of a shutter step with getting students up to speed and getting that engagement level there? For sure. It's been definitely a challenge. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's also compounded a little bit by the fact that my class time is scheduled for 8.30 in the morning, um, which not a lot of students really enjoy. And also that it is second year electricity and magnetism, which is um, kind of notoriously a challenging course in, in our curriculum. So those two things together with um, 
not actually being able to see any faces while I'm teaching is is really challenging for sure. Um, I've tried a bunch of things. I tried breakout rooms right at the beginning. Uh, they were globally panned by the students. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like just panned. Um, and then I've been doing some polling. I've used the Zoom polling quite a bit to sort of try and get their feedback as we go along. I'll work through a problem on my tablet and then give them a question that's kind of like a follow-up, check your understanding question. And I'll post that as a multiple choice Zoom poll and then we'll talk about that after. But it, it's definitely very, very different this semester. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, so I guess from that kind of comes the question, uh, do, the style of teaching that you're undertaking uh, clearly has had to change, but do you have a personal like philosophy with teaching or a personal style with trying to get physics into the brains of people as they come from perhaps not a physics background even uh, coming forward to, to become students? Yeah, I think it's very different when you're talking about, I mean, it's like in any anything in communication, it's always audience, audience, audience. Um, and so in the teaching in the classroom, it's the same thing. If I'm in this big room, which is a 300 seat lecture room for teaching students who have never taken physics before, then I take a different approach than if I'm in a small setting with 30 or 40 physics majors who are taking electricity and magnetism in second year because they really love it and really want to learn more. So it's a different approach for different um, audiences, I think. And certainly in the first year big classes, we try to use a lot of demo equipment. Um, and we definitely always try and do what we call predict, observe, explain. So we'll um, set up what the experiment is or the demonstration. We'll say predict what you think is going to happen. Then we'll observe it and then we'll talk about what the result was. Well, I mean, that seems like a perfect segue to go into something fun. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you've got an assortment of uh, I guess gimmicks behind you, just in case the questioning goes off the rails. Is that the, the idea behind this? That's is right. That, that was my plan. Is I'm just going to distract with the colorful sphere over beside behind my shoulder. Well, is there anything you want to show us? I mean, this is a, a unique opportunity to actually get to do demos for an audience tonight. Uh, do you want to go ahead and show us something? Sure. I'm going to have to take my headphones <laughs> out. But um, so the idea is we're going to do the we'll do the sphere. So the sphere is a demonstration of angular momentum. So when something is spinning, um, it has a certain amount of angular momentum and how the mass is distributed around the axis that it's rotating um, and how fast it's going is both part of that angular momentum. So if I change one thing, the mass, how it's distributed, that will change the other thing, which is how fast the thing is spinning. So we all know this from watching figure skaters, right? They're spinning slowly when their arms are extended out and when they bring their arms in tight, they go faster. So that's what this demo is. Hold on one second. So I get it spinning and then I make it smaller and it goes way faster and then I expand it out again and it goes much slower. So very much like the figure skater. And much slower when it's spread everything. Okay, I can hear you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty great. So I guess we might as well throw to Martin. Martin, what have you prepared tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have um well <laughs> it uh, the, but uh, in terms of the teaching and my uh, teaching philosophy, I guess that's the question you were sort of asking. Well, what, what's the, because I have no demos <laughs> besides uh, besides the wine that I'm drinking. You know, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but seriously, in terms of my uh, teaching philosophies, I like I really like uh, uh, sort of what we call active classrooms, classrooms where or spaces where there's lots of emphasis on uh, peer instructions, where students uh, are actively engage in the in the learning process. And I think that's really, really important. So um, typically my classrooms, uh, there's lots of noise, arguments, shouting, because I think uh, I, I think that peer instructions, learning from your well, from your peers is one of the, the, the best ways to learn and some sometimes the, the most efficient way to learn. So what we do in the in especially in our big first year classes, there's a lots of clicker questions and all of that sort of stuff where people get a chance to articulate 
their, 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 their um, you know their views or what they think is the the, the main concept behind a particular uh, a particular question per se and so the that's typically it's been nice to the classroom i like I, I like classrooms that are engaging where students are a part of the learning process and uh, that's a that's a you know i think that's a really that has, has been a transformative uh, experience to me i've had people who passed my classroom and uh, sort of walked in because they swore that the class was over they said surely you can't be teaching <laughs> with that amount of noise <laughs> in there but uh, it's it's really quite a, it's been quite a uh, you know a fun ride well, it's interesting because I think a lot of people coming from high school, uh, young students, or coming from maybe not a physics background, often are trepidatious about taking a first year physics yeah. class and can also be kind of nervous about participation. That whole fear of seeming, uh, the, getting the wrong answer in front of your peers, yeah. the feeling like you're feeling like you're stupid or, or feeling silly answering in front of people. So it's kind of an interesting idea, this this whole one of bringing everybody together and trying to get all their feedback and input. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that students feel much more, you know, they they feel much safe in terms of expressing their their, their views. And one of the interesting things, the just the thought process that is required to to sort of um, articulate what it is you think you're thinking helps to sort of crystallize out your thinking. And it's an important part of the learning process because just talking to your peer and trying to explain to them why you think a particular answer is the right quote unquote answer is sometimes students would start that process start to exp start to explain and then said oh no that doesn't make sense so right that, yeah yeah <laughs> you know, so that is a really important part of the you know rather than sitting passively listening to me i think that being engaged in the during the course of the the um the uh, a lecture is a really important part of the learning process. Um, I said it's really students are really surprised when they step into some of these classrooms still in terms of what occurs. Mm. Joanne, do you have anything to, to jump in there with that talk? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, like with anything, learning how to do physics is all about practice and getting and getting guidance from those who have walked down that path a little bit ahead of you. And that's really what Martin and I try to do in our classrooms is, you know, it's one thing to watch someone solve a problem and you can think, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. I know what to do. And then you go home a few hours later and you sit down and you try and do your own problem and you don't even know where to start. Um, it's like trying to learn tennis by watching, you know, yeah. the, the US Open. It doesn't work that way. You have to hit the ball. And that's really um, what physics, we try to do in our physics classes, give them as many opportunities as yeah. they can to work together and get that all important practice. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Now, I also wanted to point out that <clears throat> we are streaming live tonight and we do have an audience. If there are people out there who have questions, feel free to post them in the chat and we can come to them as we need to. Um, we often get this question that I, I hear a lot about from students uh, about What's a good prof? Is this person good at teaching uh, physics? Is this good person good at teaching e &M? Can this person get across to me? But I think it might be an interesting thing to ask the question of you both. What makes a good student? If you're looking towards giving advice to physics students as they come in, what tools can they bring with them to be prepared so that they can succeed? Um, I'd go for us, I guess. Um, <coughs> I. I guess uh, I'd be careful not to color this with my personal preference. Um, I think that <laughs> students, I think discipline, the, the discipline is a very important word. Um, I know it's sort of cliche, but students who are disciplined tend to do much better because you, you, manage, you have good time management skills uh, and um, there's, there's, there's lots of distractions uh, on campus. And I think, so a good student, of uh, the invariably is a fairly disciplined student. I think that one of the key attributes of good students is persistence. Because if you're, <laughs> you're, gonna, get, <laughs> you're gonna get knocked down, you, you know, things are not gonna go the way that you, you, you come from, you, you, the, the high school environment is significantly different to the university environment. And you know, there are things that are not gonna go your way. And you will have the option of either saying, you know, poor me, 
why is this happening to me? You know, well, I'm mourning for the rest of the, 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 the semester. Or you can get on with it. Uh, and I said, it's, uh, persistence is really important. You can't, at the first hurdle, throw the towel in and say, you know, I can't do this. You, you, you have to stick, you, to, you, you get stuck in and stick with it. Um, I think that um, an appetite for hard work um, is important to, to recognize that this stuff is not going to be easy. If you're looking for easy, um, <laughs> you're probably in the wrong place. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyone can do easy. It's going to be challenging. It's absolutely going to be challenging. So um, be prepared for, you know, to work hard. Uh, the, um, motivation, be motivated. Don't come and say to me that you're bored. You got to, a lot of times you have, you can't say, oh, my classes are always boring, whatever this, you have to motivate yourself sometimes, yeah? And, and deal with that sort of stuff. So I would say, the, um, try not to moan. Nobody likes students who moan constantly. <laughs> Sorry, I should probably say that more. Well, but say. I mean, but there, there, there's some, some truth to that in that, you know, that a student is responsible to a large extent for yes. their own learning process. And I mean, you can't necessarily measure it by the number or the grade that you get. Your levels of success are sometimes measured just by your ability to make it through a class yes, or, to yes. under, or, or to graze through a topic with some understanding and not letting that burden you moving forward. So sometimes the barometers of success that, that a student has coming in, I think they expect to get these high grades or these big letter values, get A's and A pluses on everything. When in reality, sometimes you just have to be able to understand that you need to do more work on a topic or it, the success means so many different things to different people. Yeah, yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll that. Joanne, do you have something to hop into there with? I would just say that um, I think it's great to, to try and definitely time management skills, I think, is something that um, students need to develop as they go through. And it's not necessarily all going to be in place on day one in first year. Um, but that's definitely something that you need to uh, home as you go through but also I would say um, ask for help if you need help like that's what we're here for um, and even though you're in these big classes in first year um, and you feel like you're just you know a number uh, we have times that that the TAs are available for help. We have times when the instructors are available for help. And, um, you know, even when I'm teaching a large 600 class, uh, student class, there are times where I have my help time and, you know, two or three people show up. Um, I'm there to help. So if you're, if you're really struggling, then make use of that, those resources. Mm -hmm. I, I have an interesting question here that, um, we had uh, we put a poll out on social media before uh, this event tonight about questions to ask uh, either of you. And this is a question that came in that I thought was an interesting one and I think kind of ties into this topic, um, which was, what if I like physics, but I'm not smart enough to take physics? Who says you're not smart enough? Well, that's, that's kind of the thing, right? It, it's, it's, you know, I see so many students coming to physics later even transferring over from the biological sciences we have these large biological science physics and biological science classes uh, coming into physics and people who were just kind of turned off of physics at a young age and have been made to believe or to think that it doesn't it's not something for them um what do you have to say to those people <laughs> i don't know i would say firstly the, my uh, my opinion and the base of my experience i would say firstly Talent is highly overrated to be a physicist. You don't have to be exceptionally smart to be a physicist. I think that what is much, much more important is practice. Time spent doing is, is, is the most related to success uh, in a subject. To be good at anything requires practice. And so I, I think that um, <laughs> practice and persistence, as we said earlier, those are to, to me those are two key attributes that are much 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 more important than talent or smart because i said historically i think that sometimes even being quote unquote smart can be counterproductive because some of those students get really lazy they never really learn some of the skills that are absolutely essential for success at an early stage in their university career and when they get to, to, to the upper levels 
where you you actually have to work hard and you have to, you you have to do the stuff. You can't rely upon your quote unquote your natural ability. They've never developed those kind of skills. They've never sat down for four hours doing something. Yeah. And um, they find that really difficult to make that sort of transition. So I'd say don't uh, they'll, they'll, don't go that line. They'll, 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 you know, um, the physics. Uh, people tell me physics is hard. Sometimes I translate that to say perhaps you're a bit lazy because you don't really you don't really come. <laughs> sorry, you don't want to come to terms. <laughs> it's it's really back. As it, it is. It is. It is demanding. Physics, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I would say it, it is demanding, yeah, that you have to spend time with, the, with um, physics, probably more than some other disciplines. You have to sit and do the work. It's not a spectator sport, yeah? So yeah, if you invest the time and you do the practice invariably, you're okay. But, okay. Um, yeah. Like this, this actually ties into a question that we just got in the chat which was that a lot of people seem to drop physics when they find that they maybe were getting straight A's in it in high school and they come to university and find out that they're not doing as well and they just kind of drop it and walk away. Um, the question was, how do we mitigate this kind of thing? But I think you're answering it is, is in this idea that, you know, the work definitely has to be put into it. Um, I find personally that uh, things could kind of even 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 the use of integrating video things like Khan Academy. Well, I mean, I, I guess maybe we shouldn't say it specifically. Uh, so forget that. A completely unnamed and totally different series of YouTube <laughs> videos that are just showing people how to do the mathematical problems. Um, I think people watch these and think that they know how to do the problem. Mm -hmm. It goes back to something that Joanne said before, which is that you have to do sit down and do it yourself. You have mm -hmm. to put the work into it. Joanne, do you want to spin off with that? Yeah, well, I think I, I, you kind of rattled our cage a little bit, I think, here in this question about I'm not smart enough because mm -hmm. this is a huge pet peeve of mine and I personally attribute some of it to um, the Big Bang Theory and this notion that mm -hmm. uh, to be a successful physicist you need to be, you know, uber smart like Sheldon Kennedy and or Sheldon Cooper, <laughs> Sheldon Kennedy. Um, but I honestly, I think um, there is so much overemphasis on this notion of natural ability. And and really, I just I don't really think that that's a, as major a factor as Martin was saying. I think there's definitely a positive feedback loop that happens with kids when they're little. There's something, something that they're interested in, in, whether it's math or drawing or whatever. And so they do it. They sit down and do it for fun. And then they get more practice and then they get better. And that's positive feedback for them. So they keep doing it. So I think students arrive at university already with a certain mindset of this is what I'm good at. But that's what they're good at because they've been doing it for fun for 15, 20 years. Um, and so there's this, I, I just think the idea of natural ability is really just completely overrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Because natural ability means that you don't have to practice. You can just watch on the sidelines and become really good at it uh, without any practice. You know, you know, my dream of being a soccer player was because <laughs> I thought that I was amazing. And suffice to say, I never, I never, uh, I never made it. Not because of my talent. I think it's because I never, I, I was never interested in the practice. Uh, you know what it demanded of me. Yeah, um, I just didn't fancy getting up for uh, whatever hours and running around any track and that sort of stuff. Right. So yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Now we we've got a, a question from the chat here. Um, this one comes from a, I believe, a, someone called Jay Ingram. Uh, who's watching right now. Um, he says that the two of you have reputations of being good teachers. Uh, you don't have to refer to yourself specifically, but what do you think goes into effective teaching? Hmm. Good question. Martin, you want to go first as you're the director of... of... <laughs> well, this is the thing that ties into your new position or your current position as well, uh, Dr. Williams. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, what makes a good teacher? Um... Well, we've already talked about what makes a good student, and they're putting their work into it. Sure. I mean, personally, I didn't realize how much work was involved in teaching when I started teaching. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. How much you have to completely construct and get the idea straight in your head yeah, before yeah. delivering it to the student. How much of it lies yeah. can lie with the problem with you as the instructor? I guess I, what I do, I'll answer the question because I guess from the professors that I really liked, 
you know, my experience, what the, the professors who I taught were really excellent professors during my career. I mean, they're um, both here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, the, the good professors are, I would say, uh, um, engaging, passionate, enthusiastic. Yeah. So, so if you show up in my, if I show up in my class and I show no enthusiasm, no passion, you know, if I can't engage my students, I think that you're, um, you know, you're in a, a sort of lost situation. Students, uh, students must walk into the room and feel that sort of passion and that the, the, the you know, that the, the enthusiasm that is sort of contagious the, the, and captures students' imagination. So I think those are really important bits. I'd say also good professors are generally compassionate. I'm not compassionate, but good professors <laughs> are extremely compassionate uh, um, in the sense that they, they, you know, they understand the challenges that students uh, have, and they actually like their students. You shouldn't. I think if you <laughs> if you don't like students, probably <laughs> if you find students as a, a, a sort of nuisance. Probably, I don't know. Um, well, it's, it's one of those things, too, where everybody can have a bad day even. And you have to absolutely. realize that as yeah. an instructor, you know, that translates to that student sometimes yeah, yeah. in ways you didn't even think about. Absolutely. Yeah. Personally, I would say personally, just to end off, what I try to do, I try to be prepared, always be prepared. Prepared, they spend a lot, a lot of time preparing. Um, and my students sometimes are amazed about, uh, when I say how much time I spend preparing for a lecture. They, they sometimes they just think I just show up. And I, I said, really? You think I just show up? <laughs> so I think preparation is really good. Uh, preparation, I try to be organized and not always. I try to listen the, to what the, the students are saying during classes Yeah, and try to be patient. So those are the things I try to remind myself when I step into the classroom. To be as prepared as possible, try to be patient, organized, and listen. So I would say that um, I think a good teacher is empathetic. Um, I think that's uh, somewhat along the lines of what Martin was saying. But I think being able to to um, read the room and really even just by body language assess how things are going and be prepared to improvise on the fly like you can't um, you know if things aren't if they're not understanding what you're saying you can't just keep saying it and hope eventually <laughs> it's like a terrible, it's game of, a terrible game of charades or uh, <laughs> or, or or guessing your drawing like. Whatever, right? you're like this is it's like no i don't know what that means exactly so flux is not going to help anybody um uh, so yeah you have to be prepared to to improvise and and go in a totally different direction i think um just like with learning i think you need to be prepared to put in the work as martin said i think you need to um be prepared to fail like try things yes um yes, that that are you know different for good reason don't just try things but you know based on the pedagogy try something and and you know see what happens and get feedback from the students as you go because you know this is a it's a dialogue it's a it's a team effort it's um we're both working together here um so it's, it's constantly checking in and trying to assess how things are going yeah yeah i think one of the things that that i struggled with as a student was trying to come to terms with the fact that even though you might not be able to say answer a solution on a quiz or answer a problem on an exam within the 20 minutes that you're allotted for the time doesn't necessarily mean that you're a poor student it just means no. you didn't get it within that time and i think it's something as well as a, as a teacher that it took me a long time to struggle with was this idea that well, yeah. it might take a few versions of trying to teach this topic until you finally are able to explain it to somebody in a yes. way that makes yeah. sense. And so maybe one of the takeaways is this whole, you've got to put the work in, but don't expect it to happen right away. I mean, all of this is, is this isn't a process that needs to be conquered in a matter of minutes. This is a lifelong process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well said, Jay, because I think that when I prepare a plan A, and plan B, generally for every concept, how I'm going to teach it. These are the, the, the you know, this example, I'm going to use this example. If they don't get it, I can now, uh, I tried this. The, 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 I tried this way, yeah. Well, I um, find sometimes reordering things in lecture can be yeah. the pivotal thing that affects yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, let's 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 move to, to something. Uh, let, let's change the subject here a little bit. Now, I see an assortment of different things at a table over there. Uh, Dr. O'Meara, do you have any <laughs> a, another fun demo that you'd like to show us and the people at home? Sure. So when I got here today, I went digging through the the back room, which is actually directly behind the screen underneath the, the, the tiered seating uh, in case you want to see this is what our, our lecture room looks like so i'm here in our big 300 seat lecture room so all our demo equipment is underneath there so i went digging around and because i'm teaching electricity and magnetism right now i grabbed some electricity ones so i have um some electromagnetic induction demonstrations so that's the idea that if you have a changing magnetic field you can create a changing electric field which means you can generate a current um, so, what should we do? Should we do the, do the, we'll do the ring launcher. Nice. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, this here is called the ring launcher. What we have is a solenoid, which is a coil, which we run a current through, and that generates a big magnetic field. I'm going to put a conducting material on top of it, which induces a current which creates an effect. All right, so the first thing I'll do just to demonstrate that this is what's happening. I've got a light bulb here and it's connected to a coil that I'm going to put over this one and I'm going to turn the current on in the solenoid and it lights up the light bulb. You see that okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. So now I'm going to take an aluminum ring. Aluminum ring. I'm going to put that over the solenoid. I'm going to turn the current on. Ooh. And then I have an aluminum ring somewhere. This aluminum ring, which has a cut in it. I'm going to put that one on, and normally I would ask my class to predict what's going to happen when I put this one on. So, any predictions? I can't hear you anyway. All right, <laughs> let's see what happens. Okay, I'm pressing it down. Nothing's happening. My ring does not fly off. Put the complete ring on. Woo. Woo. And it did. Ta-da! Fantastic. That's great. As you so can see, I prefer teaching when I'm standing up and I can move around. Well, I was going to say, so do you feel <laughs> like you're back to, to teaching again? I did. It was about as rowdy as it normally is at 8.30 in the morning in this room. No, not really. <laughs> It's, it's, it's funny, there was a question in the chat earlier, um, and we talked a little bit about it briefly at the beginning, but now with, with this kind of uh, move now towards remote teaching, clearly uh, methods of engagement like that, um, not having that available to you in the classroom affects us both as instructors and as students. Um, what have you found are good ways to sort of combat that or to get around that? So doing the multiple choice questions where we can talk about the concepts and, and get their feedback doing it that way is one. Um, certainly recording some videos of some of our more common demos and making them available before class and then talking about them. Uh, what I've been doing with my students is I have them do a little bit of reading or watch something and then they have to do a quiz, which is like five multiple choice or true false questions based on what they had to do before class just so that they're keeping on top of the material. And then the last question of that quiz is always, what did you not understand? What do you want to talk about in class? And so I use that feedback um, before my class. I go through all the answers and see, and then I can tailor my, it's almost like your choose your own adventure type lecture. I can tailor what we're going to talk about that day based on the feedback from the students. So trying to use some video component, trying to use just some reading material, um, as much as possible before class so we can spend time together uh, most efficiently on the things that they're having trouble with. Interesting. Now, Martin, you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, research about this type of thing coming out with students experiencing Zoom fatigue and things like that. Um, have you heard any ways that students can combat that kind of 
a new problem that really wasn't even a factor before. Uh, clearly, we're having a, we're just trying to get a handle on it now. But you're probably at the cutting edge of that research these days, right? <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Um, but I said the, the, most of that stuff is still sort of emerging. Um, right. I think this is uh, the I, there's there's there's, there's the sort of a lot of sort of common sense um, suggestions um, in terms of you know students have not having any sort of transition from one class to the next. So you're literally sitting in front of a screen. You don't have to walk to a classroom from one classroom to the next. And those the, the, those transition times are really really important in terms of you getting ahead. You know, if you have to walk from McNaughton to Rosansky, just walking and chatting with your friends and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's a way of resetting, and that's really really important in the learning process. And it's sometimes it's something that uh, you know we've neglected. So um, sort of deliberately taking time to. The, between the classes, if, if you're sitting and you're doing sort of um, the, you, the, you're the, you're doing live streaming or whatever it is your class is being delivered, to take some time to walk away and go and do something else is really it it sounds fairly commonsensical, but it's a really important part of this whole learning process. You're sitting in front of the, the you know the one class after the next in front of the screen all day. It's really really take it takes its toll on all, all those who are involved. And I think students are still trying to figure out how to learn this way in, in this sort of remote environment. Uh, you know, professors are trying to figure out how to teach. But students sometimes we forget how difficult and challenging students are finding this whole process of learning how to learn remotely. They have never done this either. So sure. it is, it's, it's, it's really a bit of a challenge. And I said, um, the, 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 the research is still sort of, a, a lot of that stuff is still emerging and there's no, well, you know, panacea, there's no magic bullet in terms of how to, you know, how to offset some of the fatigue associated with this uh, sort of environment. Yeah? Well, and I mean, I think it, it comes back and speaks to that point that you both brought up earlier about, <clears throat> about the compassion. Um, and as an instructor, really just trying to be empathetic with what everybody is going through right now. And I mean, I think that just kind of speaks a lot to trying to function in society these days is yeah. just remembering that everybody is going through something right now. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's think back to uh, back in the days when we used to be able to be in classrooms, which will hopefully return again. Um, mm -hmm. People always want to ask me about uh, funny teaching stories or ridiculous teaching stories or anything along those lines um, that you might or might not want to share. Uh, I uh, 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 routinely um, have shared the story about how we now have uh, fire and emergency protocols in place because of my <laughs> demonstrations that I've <laughs> done in classrooms before. Which, when I started, uh, it didn't exist. It didn't seem to be a problem for the 125 years that, or the 115 years that the department was doing demos prior to my starting. Um, do you have any funny teaching stories either of you want to relate? <laughs> I've certainly broken plenty of things. Um, the uh, used to be a, a hoist in the ceiling here. We've replaced it, but the previous one I accidentally smashed with a garbage can when we set off the um, like liquid nitrogen rocket one time. Um, I was just thinking about a time in this very room actually where um, so I have a uh, hearing loss and I actually am a fairly decent lip reader which I find quite helpful in large classrooms and uh, there was one time in this classroom where the students were sitting two students were sitting way up in the, the like back section and one turned to the other and asked her friend a question which was a really great question and I I heard her ask the question by reading her lips and they didn't even realize I was doing it because I went oh that's a really great question uh, the question was and then I told the whole class what the question was and then I answered it and the two of them were completely <laughs> dumbfounded they're like how did she hear us like yeah the looks on their faces were priceless and that's when I realized what I had done and anyway <laughs> It made for a laugh. <laughs> Great. I don't know. You know, I, uh, the, uh, this is funny to me, but it might not be funny to others, but um, I, I recall, um, you know, once, uh, uh, it must have been the first, uh, the, the, the first or second class of the semester, and this was a first year, I said a, a group of first year students, like 300 students, and I'm in my stride and just going on, and 
um, a student sort of timidly puts her hand up and says, um, can I ask a question? I said, yeah. Why are you two or well, Yes, you can ask a question. He says, um, how should I, um, what, what should I call you or how should I refer to you? Um, do, do you, should you, do, should I say sir or professor or doctor? And without breaking stride, I said, my preference is his royal highness. And <laughs> I just continued <laughs> teaching. <laughs> and to my shock, honestly, I kid you not, you know, the students believed. My students <laughs> believed for like a week. A w- they went around and asked people, <laughs> other people in the department, if it is true that they should refer to me as his royal highness. Yes, so I I could believe all gullible occasionally. So, my is, uh, so I guess that's a bit sort of meanish, but uh, I found it really funny. And to this day, some of my some of my colleagues still tease me and refer to me as his royal highness <laughs> because they heard from students about that story. So yeah, yeah. So that was. Um, uh, that, that that was interesting. Um, uh, I I don't know if it was interesting, but what I noticed is that if you take my class, your pet seems to die. I don't know how <laughs> my students, <laughs> all my students always have stories <laughs> that they need accommodation because their pet, some pet has died. So I don't know. It's, I think it must be something to do with me. <laughs> so it's a warning. Don't take my class because your pet apparently is going to die. And I'm going to hear about this. <laughs> and it normally occurs just around when there is some quiz or whatever. There's something due, some assessment due. <laughs> All right, segue your way out of that one, Orbex. I was going to say, well, we go from an awkward story into an awkward segue. Um, (laughs) I mean, clearly, uh, 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 you are both um, charismatic instructors. You have a lot of fun while you're teaching. Uh, And we've talked about this idea of, you know, um, that anybody can do physics. Do you find that you get a lot of converts? Do you find that, uh, for those of you who are maybe coming to Guelph or aren't here currently, uh, a large portion of the students that we teach aren't physics majors. There are a lot of uh, uh, taking physics for the biological sciences or for some of the other courses that require you to get a physics, uh, one or two physics classes. Do you see a lot of people who are kind of all of a sudden have this awakening in first year that physics is really something that they want to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes that, I think that one, uh, one of the major differences is that um, high school, uh, what is considered uh, uh, their experience in, uh, with physics in high school is fundamentally different from what mm-hmm. university physics is. And so I think a lot of students are really startled and surprised and um, become extremely engaged when they discover what physics is actually um, from the, the, the lens of the, um, the, the, you know, being in a class at university. And I'm always, uh, you know, I've had so many students over the years who have uh, quote unquote switched into physics and really enjoyed it, um, discovered their passion. And uh, because I think physics is such a beautiful subject, I'm only slightly biased. Um, it's, it's hard not to, uh, I think the majority, I think Joanne normally would do polls with uh, students in the life sciences at different stages when they came in, their perceptions, and later, you know, later on and um, in the, during the course of the semester. And it's always the, amazing to see the change in the thought process in terms of people's perception of what they think physics is. Because I said, I, physics has a really bad rap in high school, where you know, a lot of uh, uh, students will think what they think physics is, is actually not well, the, what physics is, obviously, because we know that. But yeah, I think that quite a few students, uh, I think the, the, the largest number of, for, for, a lar- for a long period of time, the largest number of students who would um, probably switch into physics would probably come out of that life science cohort. Uh, yeah, and that was really sort of rich ground for recruiting physics students for the longest while. Yeah. I think a big part of that is that we do our first year physics for life sciences students quite differently than um, than what they would see in high school, but also what you might see at other universities. Um, so uh, it's not uniformly true. There are definitely other schools that do similar things, but we tend to focus very much on the physics of 
biological systems. Um, so we look at the optics of the eye and how the uh, how hearing works and how um, you know biologically relevant molecules absorb energy from the environment. Um, and so that's that is really quite different to students who have come from high school and have spent you know grade 11 and grade 12 talking about um, all the important things that they need to learn in mechanics and electricity, but now we can apply those to more interesting, more complicated systems like biological systems. And so that um, tends to turn on the light bulb for some students, and then that often leads them into our biological and medical physics program um, as applying the physical concepts to uh, medical and biological systems. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we're getting pretty close to the end here. We've already been going for 55 minutes. Um, I just wanted to throw out a final pitch that if anybody is looking to have questions, uh, put them in the chat and we'll bring them up before we finish. But we have a, have, we had an idea uh, here at the Department of Physics uh, social media team. Okay. Our, one of our students, Mel, had an idea for uh, a closing segment. Uh, she couldn't join us tonight, but I thought we should still go through the segment. Now, this segment is called Myth or Truth. Uh -oh. This idea of demystifying ideas about physicists. So we had a, 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 a pretty good one here. Um, and this one, I'll throw this to both of you. We'll see how it goes. And the question is this, Myth or Truth, physicists are bad at spelling. Mm. Universally not true. Yeah. Yes, there are some bad spellers. Myth. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the key is that the ones who are poor at spelling uh, seem really to be make fair. us look super bad. Yeah. Good. Yeah. They seem to be very bad at it. <laughs> All right. Here's another one then. Myth or truth. Is it impossible to be a physics student and still have a social life? Define social life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it is one of those things, too, to point out that, as Martin had said earlier, um, there's a lot of work involved in doing a physics undergrad. And But I think through that work, you do end up fusing a pretty uh, integral peer group uh, with your, your classmates that you, you went with. I mean, I'm still in contact now, 20 years later, with some of the people that I went through undergrad with, and it's just... You kind of come out of this with this 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 mentality that you made it through and you did that degree. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, no, I, it is I, possible to have a social life. I, I don't know if I would have called that a social life, true. though. I mean, <laughs> since moving on, I realized that there was more. Um, all right. Well, that's how that segment went. Interesting. Uh, we, <laughs> we have a question from the chat. Uh, does Martin support bingo in his classes? Bingo. <laughs> I have no clue what a question means. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's some kind of inside joke, but that's the fun about the stream. Well, I see we've got one. Uh, we, do we have one last demo left on the table there, Dr. Romero? Do you want to take us to the demo table? We'll use that as our way out. <laughs> sure. Okay. So also electromagnetic induction. So we have a tube over here. We have a plexiglass tube and we have a metal tube and I have two plugs. They look the same. One is magnetic and one is not. Before you, before you leave, make sure you adjust the camera so we can see it. All right, so <laughs> this is my plastic tube. I have the regular plug. I drop it through, falls regularly. Same with the magnet. Nothing very exciting, but when I take the magnet and drop it through the metal tube. <laughs> okay, see what I'm doing? I'm not tall enough. Okay, ready? Can you see that at all? No. <laughs> no? Like that? There you go. Yeah, that would have been perfect. Yeah. Okay. Maybe <laughs> metal tube ready. Hooray! Hooray! Not metal tube. Goes through much faster. Okay. <laughs> See, be prepared.
prepared to fail because it doesn't always go right the first time. <laughs> so why did that uh, take so much more time to go through the aluminum tube than the, uh, than the acrylic tube? Right. So the magnet moving through the metal tube uh, means that you have a changing magnetic field inside the tube, which creates a current inside the metal tube. And the current that gets set up is in the opposite, creates a field in the opposite direction. So it slows the magnet down as it falls through the tube. Fantastic. Um, all right, well, I guess we're getting close to being done here, but I wanted to do one last uh, question that I th figured I'd throw to both of you. Um, you're both incredible teachers. I mean, you could go through the litany of awards that you've both won, so I will. Um, you know, you have the, the Special Merit Teaching Award from the University of Guelph Faculty Association, Presidential Distinguished Professors, CAT Medals. Joanne is a 3M National Teaching Fellow. Um, these are all... Uh, aimed at uh, applauding you for being such incredible instructors. But my question to you would be this, did you have a teaching role model? Was there one instructor that either convinced you to get into teaching or that you still remember to this very day? It's always been the thing, the funniest thing that I've found, especially with, with going out and meeting young people and meeting students, is that they always have the memory of one science teacher who just got them excited about science and got them into it. And as instructors yourselves, I mean, feel free to take this as the as the somebody you modeled your teaching style after. Go right ahead. Yeah, so I'll go. Um, I had two very different experiences in high school physics, so I'm old enough that there was still OAC back in the day, um, grade 13. So I had grade 12 physics with one teacher who was honestly horrible like it was a horrible horrible experience and then oac physics um was i that's the one teacher that i still remember to this day mr Demello was amazing um he was uh he was a new teacher but he it was a second career he had been working in industry as an engineer for many years and then he decided he wanted to teach and i think we might have been his first class um, he was just amazing, so passionate, so enthusiastic, um, all those things that Martin said uh, that make a great teacher. And he, he let us, like it felt like he let us play and explore in the classroom. Um, and it was, I mean, so fundamentally different from the grade 12 experience. So it was probably even starker in contrast, but for sure, Mr. DeMello, great, great routine OAC physics. Yeah, that's so interesting that you say that, um, Joanne, because I have, uh, I, I think um, there are two experiences that I remember distinctly. When I, um, when I started in high school, I had a teacher who had just, the, the, we were his first class, and he was so enthusiastic and passionate. Um, we obviously literally became jaded, I guess. But that was so <laughs> contagious, and so he sort of piqued my sort of, um, my interest into science. And then when I got to the, the grade 12, I was really fortunate. I locked out. I have had a really good high school teacher who was, you know, his classes were so much fun. We, you know, we everybody wanted to be in class because he did all of these amazing demos and got us to play and do stuff. So, it, you know, classes were fun, and he was so passionate and so enthusiastic. So his class was like nothing else. And he was a relatively new teacher also. So that was really, you know, I never really thought about it, but, um, you know, that passion and enthusiasm that is associated with just starting out, perhaps, um, you know, it, 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 it you know, was a big deal for me. So um, I think that the, those were the two teachers that I remember that really made a big difference to me in terms of going into physics. I never really thought about going into physics, actually, although I liked the classes. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was stuck on becoming, uh, you know, the, 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 a really good, uh, amazing soccer player. But um, it turned out to be the only thing that I'm good at. So um, <laughs> since when my dreams of becoming a famous soccer player to being the next line and Messi was dashed, um, sad the <laughs> physics was the only thing I could fall back on. Uh, but seriously, you know, it's, re it's really interesting. I thought that physics was cool. And by association, I will be cool. If I took physics, <laughs> it turned out to be, you know, uh, I turned out to be a nerd like Sheldon, to be avoided at all costs. So that didn't work. That didn't work. Out. But the physics, <laughs> that's how I ended up, how I got into physics, uh, having really good teachers, really, really good high, uh, high school teachers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, so what I'm hearing then as takeaways is that clearly a passionate teacher can make a huge difference in a student's yeah. life. 
And yes. also that all three of us are past our prime. You've got to catch us in yeah. that first year, apparently. <laughs> and that's the only time that it works out. But I'd like to thank everybody out there who is uh, watching with us tonight uh, for joining us. And we are going to continue the streaming series out through ex next semester as well. So please make sure that you follow Guelph Physics on social media platforms. You can subscribe to our YouTube page through here to get notifications. If you put the bell on, um, then it'll tell you when we're going live. But please also give us a follow at Guelph Physics on Facebook and at Figu on Instagram um, to be able to follow what we're doing and what we're coming up with. Uh, I just want to thank both of our guests tonight so much for taking the time to come and do this and for spreading some thoughts. Um, so we'll give one big last final round of applause to Dr. Martin Williams and Dr. Joanna Mira. Um, do either of you have anything you want to plug or push for people to follow? I know, Joanne, that you uh, are writing a blog and you have some incredibly exciting uh, science endeavors in the community that you might want to push or uh, mention. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm co-founder of a new not-for-profit organization called Royal City Science. So uh, Orbach, you might be familiar with this idea. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a collective of, of science enthusiasts in the city of Guelph and we're trying to work together to build a science center in the city. Um, so if you want to find out more, go to our webpage, royalcityscience.ca. We're on Instagram at Royal City Science and we're on Twitter at Royal City Sci. And yeah, super yeah. exciting. Yeah. Dr. Williams, how can uh, people follow you if they want to keep up with what you're up to? Uh, just walk behind me if you want to follow me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but seriously, I think that um, just to, the, to reiterate what you said, you know, if, if, if you were listening in tonight and you have questions about our programs and, um, you know, any questions you'd want to sort of have a one-on-one -on -one chat with myself or Joanne, please absolutely reach out to us. Um, send us an email, email or uh, get in touch via Twitter or the Instagram or something and let us know. And we are always available and willing to, to, to answer questions and to have a chat with you. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you everybody for uh, watching tonight. And we'll be posting this stream up in our archive afterwards if there's anybody you want to share it with. Um, thanks again to our guests. And uh, be careful out there, everybody. Remember, we're still in the middle of something, so make sure you stay safe. I'm the Great Orbax. Thank you for joining us tonight. And end communication. <laughs>